Mr. Faisal and Sofia. Hi. Shawana. Hi, Anis. How's things? Good. Very First good. of all, I think this is really a lovely moment to know that I have both of you for the first time i wouldn't consider it your first time although maybe technically it is but technically a podcast yeah, yeah you're quite okay in front of camera and everything <laughs> but uh miss shaban and mr faisal Let's i think test. It's, a, it's a proper pilot <laughs> uh, so i think it's it's a privilege thank you to be able to uh, sit by people who have gone through uh, a life story and hopefully still much more um and we can learn i think that's what a lot of people are missing today is uh, we need to listen more than we speak we need to understand how people who have built something from nothing and sometimes built something from something uh, what they went through uh, and i think that is where a lot of people are not taking advantage of just learning shortcuts and they take the long way and then you have all of this wealth of experience around you so i think today hopefully will give us some of that so we'll start with how did it all begin journey started um, you know to run away from my hometown which is calicut you know it's a small town in, in northern kerala so my family is one of the largest industrial family in the whole of the state you know so we've been raised um, with a lot of strict environment and uh, i said um, I wanted to go out and see the world you know so I convinced my dad I wanted to learn engineering even though I know I knew nothing about engineering at that time what engineering I wanted to be the whole purpose was to leave the hometown mm. Calicut so finally I could convince him uh, I went to Manipal uh, where I did my engineering there in civil engineering but um, uh, I was um, doing something which I never didn't want to do that correct i realized that uh, you know in the first year itself i'm not cut out for a civil engineer uh, then i said what next I, i have to go back to calicut so the the whole fear of going back to calicut moved me to the next step of education so mm. since then i did two masters uh, i finally went to united states uh, went and did my industrial engineering that's where i realized my potential as an industrial engineer uh and uh, came back you know didn't come back got a job there uh parents chased me at the age of 28 to get married um i said you know i don't think i can find a girl who can think openly like me so yeah. uh they said no no we'll find a girl for you because uh, love marriage is totally out of question in the family and that's how i met my wife shabana you know so uh we like 28 is not too bad of a year to get married i think as a man It was I think nowadays they should be 35 plus correct but, uh, 28 at, not too bad at that time it was 23 24 yeah correct i mean so 28 is too old mm. so they were worried that whether i'll find a girl or not correct okay. so uh but when we met um, you know we clicked well and uh, we decided to go back to us but unfortunately uh, i had uh, lost my passport to the excitement of getting married you know <laughs> so that's happened in new york uh so i put it uh, along with uh, all my garbage stuff that my passport also went into it i realized it when i reached new york to board the flight you know so i had to go back to the embassy and took um, an emergency landing certificate i remember literally begging that you know I, i'm getting married so that is a trump card i played that please mm. help me to reach india so with that uh, you know we couldn't come back so i was forced to stay back uh, in the family business for two years mm. but uh, i wasn't cut out to be there correct because my my mind is opened up at that time you know i has become an international person then you know a local village person from kerala so i said you know this is not the place i wanted to live and that's how we came over here in 1995 as tourists myself and shana can i ask you you mentioned you said a word you said I wanted to escape. Yes. What made you at such a young age want to escape your town? Um I think I born as a free man, correct? I liked freedom. You know, I even I I performed that same kind of a freedom for everybody in my office, uh, my children. I said everyone has to explore themselves, you know, but in a country like India or Kerala which is so conservative upbringing, we are always asked to do things mm. like whether you like it or not you have to follow a certain 
path which your parents tell you to do yes so that was the motivation for me to leave calicut and go and in but explore. you know mr vezo that um, so many in the arab world and the asian world they follow the path that their parents would put them on okay. and um, some of them i think uh, they go with it without any uh, resistance some of them maybe have resistance later on in life if they're miserable or unhappy and some of them actually do well okay. uh, and i don't think they understand that the parents don't know better because parents were brought up to think lawyer doctor engineer and that's what they want because they love their kids or they care they're like you have to do this you cannot yes. be an athlete or a singer or an artist or or because they don't have examples yes. that of success case studies maybe absolutely but it's interesting that in your case the mr faisal felt like a free man and wanted to break out which is not common correct is there something is it a movie is it a person who came out uh, who came back from the states how would that be instilled in you naturally that you think i have to leave so so we you know in a kerala um, education standards are very high compared to the rest of india you know it's a very highly literate state correct so we all studied in the whole my brothers and sister you know studied in a jesuit school you know and that is where we realized that you know the priests used to be from abroad at that time mm. you know so we met a lot of uh, priests coming outside india to come and you know teach us there so our mind was opened up you know going to such schools you know and that is where we interacted with other students and knew that there are world out there which is also very different from what we are living in correct so so i think that urge was there within me to go out and that was always a rebel you know my parents struggled with me you know from school days you know and uh, i've been always told that you are a black sheep in the family correct mm. so always question things you know to curious yeah very curious uh, to ask questions and you know find out why you're doing this so they didn't have a choice you know i was so stubborn that i wanted to go out and study uh, and dad tried my his best to you know keep me keep me in calicut at that time Uh, finally i succeeded to go out and and same thing happened here we came in 95 uh, i just called him uh, after one week yeah after one week and told that so we finally we hear your voice now okay <laughs> yeah i i told him that i'm not coming back you know me and shabana are going to stay back here he said what are you doing you are married you have one child now sofia is one year old at that time uh, aren't you responsible you know for your family you said you go for a holiday and you don't want to come back and that's how we started our career here so how was it um, for you one um to be suddenly in an arranged marriage um and then your husband says dubai let's go for <laughs> vacation and then he says you know what no you turn <laughs> i mean is it difficult to be supportive maybe blindly mm. or you were also like no we should stay here yeah so, so as a young girl i never thought of anything else i mean you brought up thinking you have to do what your parents tell you to do right so it was an arranged marriage but i i had an option to meet him and see whether I, of, of course it's not like now where the girls say no one meeting is not enough those days you had to trust your gut and make a decision so as soon as i met him i kind of fell for him and i said yes i'd like to because also i understood he is also a free spirited person like i am like that although i also grew up in a village but my father was a very broad minded person and he inculcated this interest in understanding human beings and uh, you know trying different foods or you know traveling and things like that so in my mind i had that in me so when i met him i knew i would be on an adventure right so yeah. <laughs> i was all up for it <laughs> and then you moved to dubai I, yeah so I, we were in calicut for a couple of years and then we moved to dubai we came on a holiday to meet my brother of course we, we love the place i mean it was totally different from what it is now but even then you know the basic infrastructure was there things were quite easier than how life would have been in india so again it was an adventure and i said yes why not and i i trust him right 100% so <laughs> it was not a difficult decision to make not no <laughs> and how old are you were you when you got married i was 20 20 mm. okay <laughs> interesting uh so you would yeah. you say sophia that 
you inherited or you didn't inherit this uh, curiosity for life? I definitely inherited. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, just growing up, uh, one thing he always, both of them would say is always question why. Um, because we were, our family operates differently than even our cousins, for example, and their families. Um, it might be because we were here and we grew up here without the too much restriction of society around you. Um, but it was always about you question why, you know, in business, you know, why are things the way they are? Uh, whatever you do, know why you're doing it. Um, that's, yeah, so I think all, all of the kids have that, you know, questioning spirit and to just try new things. And they question too much, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny, Mr. Faisal, is that um, when we're very young children, uh, we're explorers. Yeah. You know, you open drawers, you taste something, you're so curious and you have this um, instinctive uh, ability to keep standing up. A kid that doesn't know how to walk keeps falling and you just watch him. Yeah. Yeah. Stands up, falls again, stands yeah. up, falls again. And it's funny how the more you grow up, the more people tell you, stop trying, it's not meant to be. Yeah. Or why are you so curious? Just chill, just you know, do what everybody's doing. So it's really interesting to see a dynamic of a family that is not like that. I can personally relate a lot also because I'm obviously always trying to provoke thought and uh, questions. Now, we will rewind to when you moved to Dubai. Yeah. And I think that is also a very important milestone. So you had already some milestones in your life, Mr. Faisal, with being the curious person that thought this uh, aquarium or this fish ball is too small for this fish. I need to, I, d I definitely need to leave and explore. And it was really interesting that uh, my assumption was actually kind of correct that the priests that uh, opened also some curiosity, which is great to, to see how a child would marvel, you know, at somebody just coming from somewhere else. And you're like, oh, I, I wonder. And we didn't have Google at the time to correct. see images or, or whatnot of another country. So that was a milestone. Yep. Another milestone was you coming back and thinking, no, yep. I, I need to leave here. And then you go to the UAE, and then you're like, okay, adios, I'm chilling here. Yes. So let's see at, from that milestone what happened. Sure. So <coughs> UAE uh, is, a, you know, in my life, I think the biggest turn is when I decided to stay back here. Correct? So at that time, and also it's a strange happenings when I came on a holiday. So we stayed in a hotel, a small hotel in Karama. I still remember, a very small hotel. Um, and that time I used to smoke cigarettes, you know, and I saw a shop, triple five cigarettes, and, you know, underneath this Isa Sala Al Gurk. So I used to go and buy cigarettes uh, in that shop, and I was very curious to, something attracted about this place in me. You know, mm. There was some positive energy, you know, this place was giving me at that time. Uh, and also I met her brother, I mean, and he used to live in Ajman, you know, a beautiful place in front of the sea. So all that is, you know, giving me that additional energy to think, yeah, this is a great place. You know, I wanted to stay back here. So I called, go to the shop and say, listen, I wanted to see your boss. You know, so this guy said, who are you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> come from India on a holiday and you want to see my boss. I, I was that determined, correct? When I wanted to see somebody or meet someone, I wanted to get there, correct? So I have this, you know, determination to go all out and, and try my best. So he kept on asking me, you know, you really want to see my boss? He's the ambassador to UK, you know, his name is Isisal al -Gur. I said, please, you know, I have so much knowledge in me, I wanted to meet him. So I met his GM, Jay Sheelan, at that time, and that is where the journey started, you know. So he asked me questions about steel industry because my father had steel plant back in India. So I was able to convince him that UAE needs manufacturing you know, in 1995, because it was a trading hub at that time. And he was impressed with the kind of uh, conversation I was having at the age of, uh, at that time I was 30 years old, or less than 30, you know, talking about how important this uh, manufacturing base should be here. Mm -hmm. So he took me to meet his, uh, you know, then to convince, um, you know, so he couldn't believe that, you know, I'm talking is right or wrong at that time because a stranger coming and meeting him. And he sent his son-in-law to come to Calicut and understand who this guy is, correct? So, and that is where, you know, he saw the steel plan, met my father. Then he knew that these people are serious, you know, they have stuff in them, you know, which can be 
deployed in UAE. And the idea was to set up the first steel plant in Jabal Ali at that time. Mm. Uh, we signed an MOU, but unfortunately, we could not get the the steel uh, power requirement at that time. You know, so that time, even Jabal Ali was not that developed like what it is today. And uh, but I stayed on. I told my dad uh, something about this country. I will make it happen. Correct. Mm. So I started as a scrap business. You know, and uh, I realized that a lot of steel scrap was plentifully available here. Uh, no manufacturing because shipping to Pakistan and Korea at that time. He said, "Wow, the raw material available, power is it's okay, not too much available. Sand is available." I said, "Why not a foundry? Because that is where I worked in United States, mm. correct?" So this idea got me in. I worked two years on the scrap business, made some money, made a deal with my dad. I'll supply you scrap. You take six dollar profit, four dollars give it to me. Mm. and that gave me the capital to start the first foundry in the middle east you know so i started the first steel foundry in the middle east for oil and gas applications um uh, everybody said you're going to fail because you're competing against the western world you know i said why should i fail you know there's no reason why i fail because you know this is a hub of oil and gas just because nobody's manufacturing and competing with the western world you can't say that i'll fail so mm-hmm. let me try right. so i started uh, with a uh, 3 million dollar investment and uh, the person who really helped me was uh, late uh, abdullah sala of national bank of dubai because through my sponsor i met him and i could uh, i had the ability to convince people maybe so he was convinced and gave me a 2 million dollar loan at that time and that is how my journey started as a small foundry in ajman and it took off uh, at lot of initial problems uh, for the first 3 4 years almost went bankrupt then i learned uh, in a tough manner and became the world's largest steel foundry you know out of ue you, so you didn't tell him about the sales trip we had to the us before this yeah so started. so shabana uh, was young uh, sofia was 1 year old uh, she became 3 at that time 97 So I used to, you know, uh, some more convince Shabana to come with me because her brother was here. So Sophia used to be left with her brother and sister-in-law, and uh, I visited uh, 18 factories in 16 days in the US. Yeah. Uh, went to Europe. The idea was everybody told me that you can't compete against the Western world, correct? And that switched something in you. Yeah, I, that curiosity. Why, you know? So I wanted to see them, see what they are doing mm. in Germany, in France, and US. So we went around the world together. I said, "Shabana, you come with me." You know, so the idea was to see what they have, which I can't do. Mm. Correct. So when I came back after the trip, I said, "I wanted to be better than them." You know, so the concept I came into my mind was, I should be better than a German factory. Correct. So the entire thought process went towards that. Mm. You know, I said, "I want a technology better than Germans." Correct. In UAE, that's what I did. you know so even though the foundry was very small at that time but i bought the best technology from europe correct and that's the reason 98 99 2000 i failed miserably because i got indian engineers to work with me and nobody knew this technology in india i correct? was just going to ask you if you have the best machines was it easy to hire the right yes engineers? couldn't that that was a failure in 98 whatever i produced you know i had one order everything got rejected you know the first 6 months of production was rejected so i was panicked you know i mean i've taken 2 million dollars uh, from the bank and you know say savings and that sell for 1 million dollars it my god gone so what i did was i went to the bank you know i met my manager and i told him listen i have this problem hmm. you know i can't i don't think i can repay my loan next year so he said next year loan you're coming and telling us now that you can't repay and yes because i know that is not going to happen mm. because i'm not even shipped one container um, to europe because everything is failed so uh, i removed all the engineers which i got from india i said only way i can solve this problem is survival of the fittest correct i had to roll my sleeves up you know i started wearing blue and blue like why my workers do i didn't have the money to pay salaries to the senior managers i went down to the shop floor I got a consultant from England, and I learned the whole process myself. Mm. You know, so I worked on the shop floor from '98 onwards till 2000. You know, and learned every aspect of the technology. You know, being an engineer that helped me a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, and that is where I got the confidence that now I can conquer the world. You know, so 2001, I said yes. This is the greatest place in the earth. 
we could manufacture something the reason was people have never thought about the manufacturing base over here correct if you see we are middle of the world correct and jablali was one of the best ports you know even at that time today it is one of the best in the world in jablali ports correct so i could connect to the entire globe from uae you know and the best infrastructure and i said and the people india pakistan bangladesh sri lanka middle east countries the people are there correct all we needed was the direction correct and that's what i did you know that's something which always talk about what made me whatever i am today is this place you know it, and that advantage i think is still yet to utilize 100% because manufacturing is still not considered mm. to be a main industry yes. over here here i think uh, mr faisal it's it's kind of like a, a very good dish right in a very good dish you need very good ingredients you need good timing you need good hands all of it has to come together with a good amount of time or the right time to get a really perfected dish and for you i think um you said being a background of an engineer is one thing being of curious nature is another thing um thinking why not rather than why i think there's a huge difference between people who think why should i do this or why not do this um and i think your confidence was built immensely on two points one your visit around the us and europe to learn what's so special out there so you know your your competitive yeah. or competitor right secondly the point where you had to wear the blue uniform I think when you literally know it by hand and by experience you gain that confidence of riding the bike before Absolutely. the first time you ride the bike you're like oh I might fall yeah. how will I do it but once you get the hang of it so I think these are were so crucial and then it's kind of what you just mentioned where you were in a geographical location where you're like all of this coming together yes and I'm in the right place at the right time why not yes which I think is is just great and um, I want to mention one thing you said uh, in our in our little break so i want to reiterate it that uh, mrs shabana you, you also took over the people yes. which is extremely difficult i am a guy with my startups and my businesses and if anybody asked me what's the hardest thing i would say hiring and managing people yes so in parallel to his drive and him learning and him being on the floor and trying to build this industry and compete with the best in the world with the why not attitude what were you doing in parallel to that so while he was exploring i was also along with him exploring things understanding the industry understanding technologies every factory visit he went i would go with him although my interests were really different but i wanted to learn so i was there with him so it made it easier for me to understand what kind of team we needed what what are the Uh, different aspects you need to look at in a human being and being a mother i guess also helped me in my workplace because how do you handle your children right i mean it's the same way with every human being i guess you know you have to give them attention you have to motivate them when you have to tell them off you have to do that also so it's a mixture of all that in the end i what i realized is if you're just there when somebody needs to speak to you you just there to listen and you you know and understand them that solves most of the problem you know and then they are they are a different they are motivated in a different way because they know there's somebody always there to listen so any time anybody has a problem they come to me <laughs> they won't not tell him directly so it's like i'm like a in between yeah so we had a perfect power. combination yeah. you know i'm an aggressive person yeah. shabana is that soft person yeah. you know so they all go to her the mother the mother yeah, yeah. she was like a mother you know and I, i keep telling her you know i think she played a equal and important role in, in this journey of success you know so important yeah, yeah like i personally understand how important it is to to listen because i'm also sometimes a bit too um, focused and uh, with no emotion i just want to hit the target and uh, the more you learn that you need that soft side to you and i think now that you're a father and you you're with mrs shabana for mashallah so many years it softens you yes and you start to know how 
maybe not everybody thinks like uh, Faisal. Correct. You know, maybe Faisal thinks this is logical and it's practical, or why aren't you working harder? Why aren't you pushing harder? But not everybody's like you. Correct. And that is one of the biggest faults we all do. Correct. Like to assume people see things the way we see them. So it's immensely important for people to feel heard. Yep. Yes, that's true. And that you're there for them. And then you, bu- you build loyalty. Yes. You build this. And without that, our companies and our vision is nothing if we don't have a team. You know, so uh, it's, it's really nice to see. And you mentioned, uh, Mr. Faisal mentioned the community center where it was mandatory. Mm-hmm. How did that also play a role that when you make it mandatory? So when we built the community center, the thought behind it was we had this 1,300 people working for us. Most of them are away from home, no families around. So we wanted a place for them to come and feel at home in their free time or even during work hours. So that was the concept of the community center where we had uh, gyms for them. We had a doctor there. We had a um, coffee shop. Movie we had theater. A, a movie theater. And we served all three meals all seven days a week free for everybody there. So people could come, spend time there. There was training, very important part of the community center was training, of course. Soft skills, management skills, technical training. So we made that mandatory because it's difficult. I mean, we wanted people to know how important the training was for them uh, because after office hours, you know, they're tired. So we wanted to make sure that they come in between working hours, 45 minutes a day. They had to come. It's, it was either English or computer skills or something like that. So the for, for example, we had these workers, we taught them to fill the forms at the airport, and then the next time they came back, they were so proud of it, ma'am, I could fill the form, you know. And the idea was also for them to feel how important education is because when they go back home and they see their children, they understand that it's important to educate their children. So it becomes like a ripple effect. Absolutely. Yeah, so that was the idea behind it. It, it was a very nice place because... Everybody was there. We were, we were all eating together, Faisal, me, the workers from the factory, all together. And it was a nice of course. place to be. So, yeah. so yeah. that became actually a problem also for us. You know, it also. became so popular. So we had 3,000, uh, you know, factories and uh, offices in Umbria Free Zone at that time. So I remember, you know, the, the chairman of the Free Zone called me and said, Faisal, Faisal, what are you doing? You're creating problem for all of us. You know, you're providing all these things to the your employees. So many companies are complaining. So I went and told Shabana, Shabana, I think uh, we're creating jealousies around us. You know, so we need to do something about it. So what uh, she did was amazing. You know, so we, what we decided was we opened the part of the community center for everybody. Yeah. Nice. So we opened a separate gate. So we our coffee shop was open to the public. You know, we allowed uh, certain key people of the companies to use our facilities in the community center. So it was well appreciated, that thought, correct? And we were charging nothing from them, you see. So community center became a meeting place for Humbria Free Zone. Mm. Uh, it became a, such a lively energy over there. And that's why even today, in the community center, our name is still there, you know. Is so it, did it cause tension that the outsiders started to come? It didn't, correct? Because this is what I always tell people. When you share, you know, you think they will trouble you. No, they'll never trouble you. Because we are giving everything what they wanted. You Mm. know, coffees and teas and sandwiches and gym. Because I always believe when you build all these things, we need to be put into optimum use of that facility. Whether for you or for others. Correct. You know, it will eventually come back to you. Mm. You know, when you give, you'll get back. I agree. You know, and I always say that is what gave us all the successes. Mm. You know? We had blessings of all the people from the free zone. Even today, you know, we don't own the company anymore. Uh, it shifted three American corporations' hands, and everybody kept our name in the community center. It's called Faisal and Shabana Community Center. Nice. So, I mean, it's not normal, correct? When you sell a company, they remove the board first. That's the first thing probably they do. Absolutely, you know. So we are so happy about that. I think that's the biggest. You know, happiness we got to see that board even still hanging there and the community center is still active. Mm. Sophia, how was it growing up between these two uh, human beings next to me? It was a lot of fun. Um, We keep, me and my siblings, we keep thinking back to it because 
For us, we didn't feel like, you know, usually when your parents are working, there is some lack of attention or that you feel when you're growing up. But for us, um, I mean, yeah, he did miss a few birthdays and I remember those, but um, I think they were able to incorporate work and family life sort of very well because we used to go to the factory. I still remember the smell of the steel um, because he used to come home and his, like he would just smell of you know the factory. I still remember it. And we used to go, the first thing we do is take a round in the factory, go to the community center. My first internship was in the coffee shop in the community center. I had to make the sandwiches and the tea for everyone. And uh, she's also won the blue and blue. Nice. So yeah, yeah. the next working. one was in the factory, actually making the patterns and the molds. Um, it was a lot of fun because it was also an education. We would miss school sometimes to spend the day in the factory, but I feel like it just helps you have a better view of what life is and what work really means because in school you learn, you know, theory, but I feel like because of the experience that I had having, you know, what they've built, um, it really helped me. I think life. you started at the age of um, 13. Coming yeah, to the my first internship was at 13. 13, yeah. yeah. Because it, they, it's a one-month internship, I suppose. Or yeah, yeah, one month, yeah. So all the kids came into... So that's why this community center concept is so important in today's world. Correct? People ignore that. You know, everybody is work, making money in the factories and offices. But people is everything, you know. And... And that is where um, we are proud of our kids. You know, we put them at a very young age to interact with the people. Correct. So the community center was a big lesson for all of them. I'm sure. You know, so I think, and we could see that when they're grown up now, still that humility is there. They understand the people's problems. You know, so I think it played a role not just for the employees, for our children too. How? Um, what happened after? Because I know we're going like through a timeline. Uh, and you started with five thousand dollars, I think you said. Yes, ninety-five. Yes, and then in three million dollars was ninety-seven factory total cost. Yeah. yeah, and then so then uh, <coughs> so what I did was ninety-seven to two thousand two was the the tough period, correct? The, the blue the uniform period. Blue uniform period. Yeah. So survival was difficult for the factory because the product was not stabilized at that time. So scrap business started to boom. Mm. Correct. So I became one of the largest exporter of steel scrap out of UAE ports yes. to India. You know, India was a net importer of steel scrap. So I used to take 50,000 tons of scrap every month here. You know, so, and nobody was there at that time to understand the value of scrap. You know, here the scrap means it's junk. So. You know, but that is what the wealth is all about. Mm. You know, you look at any scrap uh, business around the world, it's gold mine. Maybe that's your book title, From <laughs> Scraps to Success. Correct. It's called, uh, I remember a movie. Our, Our corporate, corporate video. Yeah, yeah. yeah it all started from scrap. Mm. That's you know? how it starts. So the, the initial money to survive came from the scrap business. You won't believe it. Um, then 2002, when I stabilized the foundry business, all sides started to make money for me. Correct. So scrap making money and I had a cathode protection division from aluminium. From Dubal, I used to buy aluminium and remelt it for the ship uh, in Dubai dry docks. You know, so I used to supply that too. Uh, all for survival to s for keep the foundry going. Correct. That became profitable. So three units became profitable. Uh, and also I started trading in valves uh, in the oil and gas uh, Middle East markets. Yeah. Uh, so that profits, I put it back, put it back, put it back. And the only one person who told me is late Abdullah Salah. He said, Faisal, anytime you want money, you call me because I trust you. Nice. You know? So 2002, when I decided to build the largest factory, I just called him from Switzerland. You know? He said, Abdullah Salah, I'm going for a big expansion. You know, I need $10 million loan. He said, Faisal, approved. You know? And that was the vision of that man. You know, he knew the background of myself, probably, and also the gut feeling. Correct? Yes. People those days worked with that gut feeling. You know, so I always attribute one of my biggest success to National Bank of Dubai. Mm. You know, he was a man who really trusted me and gave me that confidence that we are there to back you up. Correct? So since then, I grew. I mean, our growth was average sixty percent year on year. Uh, uh, company became two hundred million dollar revenue in two thousand and seven. We broke all the records in the world for the foundry. Uh, we became one of the top in the world uh, from the foundry association of our US to Europe. Um, 
and people used to book the capacity in advance and that is where uh, this community center became known in the media why because the western media was hammering dubai's success you know they're saying that oh but the labors are not treated well i mean you know skyscrapers are coming but look at the way the labors are treated and on the other hand community center was an example of opposite what people are writing correct so during the adipak exhibition in 2007 this story came out about the factory how we take care of the people with the technology mm. you know and that is where it got the attention of dubai holdings you know and designers uh companies the by holding so send the team to really see what factory is this why people are writing about this and that is where we became partners you know so the by holdings took 45% of the company in 2008 mm. yeah so since then we just took off i mean we became you know by 2012 became a billion dollar business yeah and you still uh, you own it or you no so eventually we sold it to tyco uh, tyco was a large american conglomerate so the story is very interesting you know very yeah. very, very interesting uh, and it's with large three corporations in the last 8 uh, years and started with 5000 and started with 5000 dollars and uh, yeah there is a very interesting story about how you bought the machinery yeah oh, from yeah. germany no you You, so, you started to feel <laughs> No, no. I think he's a better <laughs> storage. Okay. So, you know, I used to wear this blue and blue. So, 99, yeah. I mean, I got this uh, first CNC machine to this part of the world. You know, five axis. That means you put the part into it, program it. It comes out as a finished product. Uh, so, I said I wanted this. You know, and this is how I was a very impulsive decision maker. So, I saw this in Germany. I wanted it. Yes. Correct? So, got it. Came in a truck. Everybody is so excited. It was crazy. costing us 1.2 million euros at that time so i was in my blue and blue i was worried that it's bank's money you know so we are unloading that machine so i was directing you know be careful be careful don't do this so there were germans uh, with the machine suppliers came in he said who are you get out of there you know i mean you are bothering us yeah. you know so they didn't know that i was the owner of the company yeah. you know i was in my normal dress the next day morning they have to sign off the receipt it's the same guy <laughs> saying <laughs> so, so he, he ran from my office i said no no no, no. <laughs> so that was a funny story yeah so yeah a lot of stories like that what what happened um, mrs shabana won خلاص you you sold everything So suddenly the workaholic doesn't have the uh, the thing that he's been thriving on. Yeah. So then you had I think a break if yes. I'm not mistaken. Yes. yes. What happened in that break? So we we got a taste of what it was like giving back with the community center basically. Mm. So that was something which we took away from that experience of EDC and that was always in our mind and you know we wanted to give back more do how i mean trying to understand how we can do this better more organized so that was always in our mind and we were looking of course then we had the investments as, as well so the investment division started mm. and he was busy with that so and that was pretty new to us so understanding that and understanding how we can do more philanthropy work is what we try to do at that time so for almost a year Two year, one year, one year, right? We were busy traveling to India, and then we f- found this new project f- about the school. That's when we jumped into that as well, and we got busy with that, and that led to another idea for another business. So, in the end, because of his blue and blue experience, one thing I think what he he learned, or even I learned, is that it, in any industry, the basics are the same. You know, you just have. just have to learn the industry a bit and use these basics in each so that's why we are mostly industry agnostic we try different industries it doesn't really matter to us because then we got into infrastructure now it's in healthcare so it and we were also thinking of wellness so it do, didn't really matter which business what kind of business it was we were all ready for the adventure but i think i think it did matter because you chose two crucial industries between uh, education which uh, even Sheikh Mohammed quoted with the uh, Dubai cares that it's the right way to break the cycle of poverty mm-hmm. is to educate mm-hmm. and he chose health mm-hmm. so these two industries if you tap into them you are enabling human beings to be sustainable 
yeah. to take care of themselves rather than you know always just donating money and yeah. then they finish the money and then they still need more money yeah. so i think you chose very well um mr Faisal, I, i wanted yeah. to you know um, pitch in on the education side of it mm. correct so when we decided to take up the school you know and that too happened because there was an interview uh, in my in our home by a local newspaper from kerala you know malayalam manor i remember that so they asked me a question what do you think of india you know at that time because when you make money and you are a bit successful uh, ev- everybody thinks that we have a solution for a problem correct and so i said you know uh, if you ask me that big question what do you think of india uh, i am not the right person to answer but one thing i can tell you if india need to progress uh, education should be available for everybody you know today my success i always attribute to my education you see so there is something i wrote in the newspaper they wrote it uh, and that is where one of the local politician contacted us and said you know can you help us upgrade this government school because in india 90% of the kids goes into government school mm. and those schools are the worst run yeah. correct infrastructure is very very poor there so 1.2 million there are 1.2 million government schools in the country 1.2 wow. million government schools mm. correct so we didn't know that because nobody even bothered about a government school you know in my life first time i saw it was during the trip and we were completely shocked to see the condition of that school mm. you know so we came and did a study with the indian institute of management to understand what the problem is and interestingly the problem is only the infrastructure is so poor because of that teachers have not motivated to teach the kids kids are not motivated to come to the school so we took up this ambitious project we said let us create a model correct and give confidence to the government so the model was very interesting we said promoting regional schools to international standards mm. through multiple interventions because it's a government school anyone can participate and it's free education yeah no anyone nobody can that was the first time it was yeah, a officially private public model private model came up in kerala yeah. mm. you know we are not allowed but the, the government i convinced because they knew the background where we are coming from so they allowed us to come into the school yeah and we spent 3 million dollars from the foundation and we said let us make this better than a private school mm. you know in 90 days so the private school was the same as the german factories that you were challenging <laughs> absolutely <Yeah. laughs> absolutely you're getting it right now so so we did that using a technology called prefabrication so we designed the school in denmark mm. a government school correct we not prefab. prefab completely prefab there was no factory in india when we came in so we found a factory which is completely shut down hmm. because it is a german factory indians did not know how to run it correct so i went and convinced this owner we will teach you how to run this factory give me for lease for 3 months to build the school he gave us for the lease we bought people from here because precast was well known in ua at that okay. time so we got an australian and few indians moved to this place called tirupur in tamil nadu took up the school uh, factory on a lease produced the entire components of the schools there shipped to calicut and built the school in 95 days so that created a big buzz in the media he said suddenly they saw a government school better than a private school with the infrastructure correct and we celebrities started to come to visit the school mm. so today that school has become top 2 school in the country out yeah. of 1.2 million government school and not just one school we created we created a movement Yes. There are 151 schools already open based on that model. It's called Nadakavu model. And also the cities like Delhi followed this model. So it really created a movement in India now. It also uh, Mr. Faisal it also created the belief that it's possible. Possible. Yeah. Cuz so many people talk in our world, you know. Yep. So Not many. just for, you know, in terms of building this model, but even for the girls, girls. there are 2400 girls. girls studying there. Um I was in university and at the time and I'd come down to see the school and he had asked me to give a talk to the 12th gr- graders there. And um so in my broken Malayalam I was asking them, you know, what do you want to do after you graduate? Because for me it's normal that you go and study, you do your in, uh, undergrad and then you know you get a job. But for them um it was we expect to get married and that's it. Yeah. And now when you go meet these same girls they have aspirations and most of them come from below poverty line and 
they're so confident now and just seeing how you know they want to be a psychologist they want to be in the government they want to be in the police force it's amazing to see and that's the real for me yeah. that like touches me every single time i think of those girls it's absolutely uh, by just changing their uniforms they're people confident. recognize them from oh they're from the nadkov school and they're so proud to mm-hmm. show that they're from the school before it was like they were shy to you know the confidence level confident. just came up because just because they're wearing nice uniforms and you know uh, dressed That's up so well beautiful. their yeah. respect they got more respect um i think and they yeah. felt more self respect for themselves and can, can you imagine how such simple things yes make a huge difference exactly, yeah. Yeah. huge yeah. maybe for us we take it things for granted we take for yeah. granted exactly don't even care yeah and i think you know mr faisal this is where uh when i just mentioned in our break that uh, going to these countries right you start to appreciate everything your shampoo yes. yep. your clean yeah. bed yep. your electricity i remember the electricity would go off every like hour and a half at Absolutely. night with a big bang and i yeah. thought like we were under siege or something and you don't all of this you take in a country that alhamdulillah we're so safe and everything take it for granted even consider these clean water yes you know yep. you know anas these uh, government schools in india the ch- parents send the children to school because the government has a midday meal program so most of the children come from families which are below poverty line and they cannot afford meals for their children at home mm. so they say okay at least when they go to school they'll get something to eat so that's a big part of the school as well so we had to actually relook at the menu there's a proper nutritionist who guides them for a three course meal you know so things like that it gives you so much it's such simple things but you know it gives you so much satisfaction thinking that they are okay having a good balanced meal you know how would you um, mr faisal knowing a bit about you now and how driven you are and how you're passionate and maybe addicted also to your work and i mean it in a positive way because i can relate um after selling and having a successful story uh with your foundry this phase in your life what what would you title this phase in your life and what what is driving you now so i think the the impact uh, i never imagined that that the impact is going to be when i build we build the school correct mm. that gave a lot of lot of satisfaction i said wow it's more than the money what we made correct today everyone respects us in the entire south of india correct and and everyone appreciated them I and there are a lot of billionaires and millionaires around us correct but what matters is what you do with your knowledge and your money yeah. and that is where when we impact of 300000 students their prayers you know uh, makes us happy all the time correct i go there every month i visit various schools now and that got me into a new business correct i mean that's what i always say when you give you don't know how you get it back and the idea came in i saw this change i said wow imagine if you build schools and hospitals in a country like india like this poverty is gone correct the whole self confidence comes up so we decided to go and build this 80 million dollar facility in a rural part of bangalore uh, in tamil nadu near bangalore uh, in nine months you know and the concept was what made this nalakar school success this prefabrication the environment the architecture behind it correct the whole mood was changed we said why don't we make this as a commercial business you know why don't we help people to build schools faster why don't we build hospitals faster so we came up with this concept of manufacturing buildings and came up with catalog catalog schools catalog hospitals mm. from 10 bed 30 bed hospital 100 bed hospital everything done less than one year from 3 months to one year you have a fully run hospital yeah like a lego you order like it, it comes gets fixed like a lego so that business started in 2014 after the success of the school that became a big success because people loved it correct they couldn't believe that something is possible mm. So that is another success happened in this journey we never expected to be we never thought of doing any business after the ETC's uh, exit uh, but as i said you know this is something beyond you can imagine because god is his own plans uh, and this is something which i always tell people is do it with whole heartedness you know give mm. keep giving yes you will get it um sophia I would it's interesting for me to see how you would at your age how old are you now if I can ask 26 26 okay so at 26 um two years before he got married <laughs> but at this very crucial uh, young 
beautiful strong age of a human being but having a completely different mindset to how your father was at 26 how your mother was at 26 and and their history and their story so you're equipped with so much that they've learned after that age and they've given it it seems their hands on parents yeah. how has that played into your mindset now that you're a graduate now that you want to you know do something what's your attitude to 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 life and to working and to for me i think the way i look at now how i want to live my life and my career is um one thing is like you said we've chosen the right industries which is like education healthcare infrastructure and it's not the business per se i don't think they ever looked at it as what business should we get into next it was our tagline is be different and make a difference i think for them it was where can we make a difference and that led to a business idea or for the foundation a project um, for me i look at it the same way i think i am entrepreneurial in my way of thinking because i've been raised by you know both of them and i know how to i've learned or i'm learning how to connect the dots and see how we can do things better but ultimately for me is where can i make a difference and i know it sounds like a bit of a cliche but i truly believe that i want to do things where i can make a difference which is why i've chosen wellness um as my avenue um but yeah i guess that answer your question i think you need to talk about your wellness a bit <laughs> that's also another podcast huh yeah i think yeah, i enjoyed yeah. Uh, yeah. seeing your instagram and what it stands for yeah but that, that's why i chose to come back uh, i was studying in the us near chicago and i worked there for a year mm. um growing up we were never forced to think that we had to join the family business actually it was the opposite They're like you go live your life nice. independent um but i'm so inspired by the the story that they've both built together i thought i have this platform already and i'm very lucky and very grateful to have it i want to give back to it and build on it mm-hmm. um to make a difference yes um so that's why do I you think it's a temporary hobby or it's something you're very passionate about no it's something i'm very passionate about i mean for me to when i came back i grew up in uae i never lived in india Uh, my first two years at KEF, I was in the factory every day in Bangalore, in a country where I wasn't used to the way things were, how life was, uh, especially being a woman, dealing with people in the construction industry is not easy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I stuck through it because I loved it. It was such an adventure. I learned so much. I learned construction. Um, I went to the factory every day, to the sites. Um, and I, yeah, I'm here because I truly believe that I want to be here. because you know um being uh, the children of wealthy parents you can yeah. get scrutinized maybe even by family members by cousins yeah. by friends by your neighborhood by your school friends and they're like ah look she just wants to do something nice uh, yeah. or she doesn't know what to do uh with the money yeah however it's that's why i asked the question because i think it's important that they hear how passionate you are yeah and how driven you are and it's not just like a, a hobby yeah. because you're you're inheriting so much passion yeah. from two people that I don't think you have a choice I think <laughs> it becomes uh, instilled in you yeah and I've also I've seen how hard they've worked I know it doesn't come easy to, to do all of the things that they do I've seen the effort put in and I I don't take it for granted that okay I can take it easy and I can you know just do whatever I want and just try things but I you have to think about everything you do and why you're doing it and put in the the effort You reminded me of something uh, the late uh, Steve Jobs mentioned and he was when he was designing for Apple he said you have to think of the customer first yeah. uh, what does he want so when you mentioned that they started businesses based on what was needed yeah. Yeah. not oh i feel like i like bicycles let me do bicycles yeah. no what does this country need what yes. does this area need what lacking. is lacking and then you reverse you yeah. work, you work backwards from there yeah. um mrs shabana What makes you feel uh, valuable? Um, when people send me messages saying, you know, you... Sh- because sometimes nowadays I, I don't go to office because of work from home concept. So I don't really go to office every day. When I get messages saying, ma'am, please come. We love to see your smile. Or small things like that makes me feel valuable. And especially when... when i go to visit the factories and the people there meeting me from the shop floor and saying 
how are you ma'am or you know just having a conversation with them it makes me feel valuable and also the philanthropy any project we go and we talk to the people on the ground there how it has affected them that also makes me feel valuable and for sure my family <laughs> I'm sure they you're proud me, yeah. yeah they give If me this so this is the example i'm sure you're proud yeah they give me so much strength and courage and motivation so that makes me feel you know <laughs> i'm valuable um you know i was just thinking of your story <laughs> and it's uh it's it's um, it's uh, i don't want to sound cheesy but it's kind of like a miracle how things come together yeah. um like you found your and i'll repeat some things uh, your curiosity at that a- age and then this the the father being convinced to let you leave and then finding a partner in crime <laughs> in beautiful crime <laughs> uh to to balance you yes. you know because you're this driven driven man curious man that wants to prove a point especially yeah. against all odds um but then you have somebody who's also looking at the soft power and the and the human beings behind your vision and then you have kids who are now you know continuing the legacy you you have to write a book in a nutshell <laughs> i think in summary a podcast won't do it justice and no. i think you should take it upon yourself to either document it in a video i think you need a few more podcasts because this is a better way of communicating in in my opinion than a book today you mm-hmm. know because we didn't touch about the healthcare you know how or one uh, or everything yeah. write a book yeah. Yeah. and do podcast yes yeah. we'll yeah. do that yeah and i think this will make you realize um i i'm sure sophie is also going to expose you to this more but when even when i do my show and i do these things and you see the long messages and i'm not talking about cool video bro no i'm talking about yeah. long stories yeah. you receive and you're like okay somebody felt better today somebody just and you'll see how your story is going to make so many people even a five mr faisal yeah. i'm not talking about 500 five and you start to feel okay i you just said when you give you get right yep. and this is one form of of uh, i think your responsibility in this life to to tell people your yep. story yep. i love i love the attitude of why not i completely <laughs> support it because you get that all the time yeah. why why do you think you can do this they do it better <laughs> uh, proved it i guess <laughs> thank you very much can, thank you time. thank you very much i appreciated it yeah i enjoyed it enjoyed it and yeah. I'd enjoy inshallah more inshallah conversations thank you thank, thank you thank you, you. Thank you